Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our welcome to our first REACH parent workshop. My name is Matt Nagel. I'm the supervisor of social studies and REACH for the district. Do we have any parents of third grade students here? Third grade students and parents. So you can thank all of those parents for tonight because we have a session for third grade parents at the beginning of the school year and during the, we kind of surveyed them at the end and asked what they want from the REACH program that they're not getting. And one of the things was programming for parents of how to support their children as they move through the educational system. And so this is one of our attempts to do that for you. I uh, especially appreciate you being here on such short notice. I know you could the paperwork only went home very recently, and that's because this is kind of a, a lucky coincidence uh, to have John Pearson here tonight while he was speaking this weekend at the New Jersey Association of Gifted Children Conference uh, just over in Somerset. John Pearson is an internationally known speaker, learning skills consultant, and author. He has worked with more than one million students, teachers, parents, and administrators across the United States and around the world. As a keynote speaker for businesses and schools, he has addressed many state and national conferences. He received from the U.S. Patent Model Foundation's National Creativity Conference for Educators the highest workshop ratings in its history. John was a winner of the Professional Artists in Schools Award and was selected to present the closing session on arts and education to the 2002 California State PTA Convention. He has been a speaker at the National Association for Gifted Conference and a featured speaker for the California Association for Gifted Conference. He has presented staff workshops on creative learning techniques in nearly every state in the United States. He has also been a keynote speaker at the Creative Problem Solving Institute in New York, the National Innovation Convergence, and the National Humor Project. John lives in Los Angeles, and in addition to consulting, has taught courses in multiple intelligences and gifted education at the University of California, Riverside. John received a bachelor's degree in philosophy from the University of California, a master's degree in the creative arts interdisciplinary from California State University, San Francisco, and a multiple subject teaching credential from California State University, Los Angeles. He has also studied at the New England School of Art and Design, the Atlanta College of Art, and the San Francisco Academy of Art. In addition to the nearly 1,000 schools with which John has worked, he has worked with corporations such as Clorox, Kellogg's, General Mills, Novell, General Motors, S.C. Johnson, United States Navy, and others, developing creative thinking programs. Still, John has never forgotten the joys of being a child and believes now, <laughs> as he did as a classroom teacher, that for learning to be lasting and meaningful, it must be creative and personal. Please join me in welcoming John Pearson. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. That was great, Matt. Can we have a big hand for Matt Mingle? Big hand. Uh, we have a bigger hand. We have a bigger hand. Even a big and a big. We have a big hand for your kids. How about a big hand for your kids? A big hand for your kids. How about a big hand for yourselves? A big hand for yourselves. How about a bigger hand? All right. Let's stop that. Let's stop that. Um, settle down. Um, uh, my name is John. I did. I had no idea the the uh, intro went on that long. I. But I appreciate. We should go on longer. No, I'm, it's a it's a joke. I'm kidding. I'm going to make sure, can you hear my voice in the back okay? Is the voice okay? Is the head okay? The tie okay? Uh, I want to say from the heart, uh, I really want to thank you all for coming out. And I'd like you to take a deep breath. Breathe out. And kind of fully get here. Just take a deep breath. Relax. Leave the traffic. Leave taxes. Leave whatever. Deep breath. And I'd like you to look around the room solemnly. And the reason I'd like you to look around them solem solemnly is yes, I think you are the people, I'm, I'm going to get mushy, you are the people who make the world work. Uh, what I mean by that is this is a Monday night and you're here. This is a Monday night and you show up. This is a Monday night and you go out of your way. You could have done a zillion things, but you're here. So take a look around and see the people who I think make the world work and give each other a hand. All right. And I mean that, I mean that quite sincerely. Uh, the evening is called Drawing Out the Best in Your Brain. How many can't draw well? Perfect. Now, the reason I say perfect is this. Uh, if you're parents of gifted kids, it's very important because many gifted kids are perfectionistic. I don't know if you've noticed that. And you can say it's okay to make mistakes until you're blue in the face, or you can actually model making mistakes and enjoying the process. So if you don't do something well, here's a tip for gifted and all kids. Do it poorly, frequently, and happily. 
So if you don't do something well, do it poorly, frequently, and happily. Poorly, frequently, and happily. Um, how many can't sing real well? Perfect. Uh, see, as a parent, instead of telling kids to do something over and over, you could sing it. So instead of coming in and, and saying, honey, bedtime, uh, daddy's tired, he doesn't have to go through the same routine every night, bedtime, 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 you know, you could actually, uh, dad's here, could actually come in with a broom, make it into a, a kind of a guitar, and just sing it. In other words, don't say something seven times, say it seven ways. Daddy loves you. So I'm going to pretend this is a surreal image, but I'm going to pretend you're my daughter, you're eight years old. Very high achieving, very brilliant, never goes to bed on time, and I'm up to here with it. <laughs> daddy loves you so. If daddy had his way, we'd ride horseback night and day. We'd ride, but we can't, because daddy loves you so. We want you to get your beauty rest, because you're beautiful, perfect in every way. Now, that may sound goofy, but your kids like to see you being goofy once in a while. Does that make sense? Here's a personism. If you want to bring out the adult and the child, you must bring out the child and the adult. I'll say that again. If you want to bring out the adult and the child, you must bring out the child and the what? And the adult. Do it sparingly, but do it. And do it, do it uh, as you will. Uh, after tonight, you're going to learn a bunch of really practical, fun, goofy, fun things, and your kids will not recognize you. I thought, what a, hey man, dad, you're freaking me out, man. What's with that singing thing and that weird? It's crazy. Now, I'm going to draw a little diagram of what I've learned after working with over a million kids, a thousand schools, lots and lots of people. This is a diagram I'm, I've come to, but I'm just going to give it to you because you guys are here and you are the best. Uh, right here in New Jersey, big hand for New Jersey. And for Hillsboro Middle School, go, go Raiders. Now, um, there we go. Now, I'm going to draw, this is the child's brain. And again, how many can't draw well? Uh, a trick. If you don't draw well, name what you draw after you draw it. So whatever it is, that's it. <laughs> so the child's brain weighs about a pound. And in the beginning, everything is with the senses. Everything comes with the senses. It's all the senses. So it's all the what? <coughs> now. The senses are a source of pure genius. And just to show how odd the senses are. For example, and when I say senses, when you were little, this was not a chair as we know it. This was like a continent. It was like all of Brazil. Because kids would come up, smell it, sniff it, bounce it, kick it, lick it, do everything but eat it, probably try to eat it. And you did too, because you look like very gifted people. So what happens is they're trying to explore stuff all the time. The stuff that we find quite ordinary and even prosaic and ordinary and even boring, they find fascinating. I was watching a couple of the children the other day in a market, a boy and a girl about four years old and five years old. And his mom was doing the shopping. The little kids were walking around the market somewhere in Los Angeles. And the little boy was, uh, they actually, the kids made it, see, the, 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 the mom has made it into an, a chore, but the children have made it into a safari. And so the little boy is going over, and I recall him pulling open the freezer. He pulls up the big heavy door, and the little girl sticks her hand in, and her expression is like this. When was the last time you expressed yourself that happily? <laughs> About cold air. Cold air. So what happened is the magic of childhood is they were constantly being uh, tickled, titillated, whatnot, by ordinary things. So there's things that are so ordinary. But one of the great things about staying young always is that nothing gets to be ordinary, ever. Nothing, ever. And another Pearsonism, nothing is boring. Your kids may disagree. Oh, that's boring, that's boring, that's boring. Boredom. You can't go out and buy a glass of boredom someplace. You have to make it. So when actually boredom is boredom something that you do with something. So what I say to gifted kids is if you're bored, see, I, I say it this way. Nothing is boring if your head is not boring. So you have the power to go beyond boredom. I know, because I was a philosophy major, as Matt pointed out, and uh, went to University of California, worked my way through college straightening bent cans in the Libby McNeil fruit packing factory cannery under the roar of cans. And a kind of a mausoleum of a building tapping the rims of cans. I'd get one little can here, another can, another can. 30 cans this way, 30 cans that way, a thin sheet of cardboard, 
another layer, that's 900 cans, another layer, another layer, another, up to about six feet tall, a forklift would come, wobble the column of cans off. I take more cans, start it again, and going at eight billion cans a night. While I did that, I learned the presidents, their wives, everything. And so now I could put in, be put into a prisoner of war camp and be happy. You know, the great escape, Steve McQueen, doo -doo 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 -doo, with the baseball, that would be me. Why is that important? That's important because somehow I realize that I'm not waiting for the party to begin. I'm not waiting for people to be interesting. I'm not waiting for the world to fall my way. I realize I am the party. You're the party. Your kids are the party. That means they can take their power back and say, hey, nothing's boring. So to start with how nothing is born, I'm going to have you get a partner. It's not a long-term commitment. Just, I'm, it's a joke. It's a funny, I guess a California thing. Um, but I'd like you to get a partner. Just turn to, and, and if it's a stranger, that's great. Meet somebody new. Uh, if you end up in a threesome, that's okay. But just, just get a partner and just kind of do that. Maybe shake hands, wave, say, say, say hi. So just get a partner. Somebody, preferably somebody sitting next to you. And if we end up in a threesome, that's cool. So get a partner and say hi and you know, meet someone. Go ahead. And... Okay, per that per well done. The, the bon ami. I love the esprit de corps. Great. Perfect. Okay, stop that. That's enough. That's, that's enough. Settle down. You, you, so, oh, now. Okay, now, <clears throat> what I'm going to have you do is this. We're going to do a little experiment. This is how mysterious the senses are. Thank you. I don't want to send that table to the office. Uh, I need to get a volunteer. Man, would you be a volunteer? You'll look good and you'll be famous and it'll be really cool. And your name, your first name is? Chin. A big hand for Chin. <laughs> now, Chin. <laughs> Uh, I learned this, uh, this is, I learned this uh, looking at watching sixth graders on a playground many, many years ago. This is called Dead Man's Finger. Dead Man's Finger. And you can do it with your kids. It's kind of cool. They'll find it way cool. In fact, if this is all you get from tonight, I consider it a success. So, Chin, would you hold up a finger? Please just put up a, and actually, step back. Well, this thing, you know, that, this would be the easy, but see, 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 a bright person, any finger. I hadn't even thought of that. Uh, I'm going to, uh, do this. I'm going to put this down here for a second. And, and in a loud voice, because it's hard to hold this, uh, Chin has her finger up like this, and I'm going to actually take my hand here and place a finger against it, like the surrender at Appomattox, so they put the rifles together like that. Then I'm taking the, uh, my, other, my free hand and going like this. It is a weird sensation, and you will discover why sixth graders call it dead man's finger. Now, Chin, I'm going like this. You take your hand and do that yourself. Go ahead and just feel that. Just go like that. <laughs> Ooh, that is weird. Big hand for Chin. It's weird. It's weird. Since we don't know each other necessarily that well, we'll just start with Dead Man's Finger. So get a partner, do Dead Man's Finger, ready, set, go. Get the ooh experience, the odd, yeah, weird, weird, yeah, weird, odd, weird, strange. C crazy. There you go. Meet a friend, meet a friend, meet a stranger, friend, meet a friend. Okay. Clap once if you hear my voice. Clap twice if you hear my voice. Okay, there's going to be an award. Uh, tonight there will be an award for best table. Re re receive a small award uh, for best table. Now, raise your hand if it was sort of weird. Say, I have the power to make the ordinary extraordinary. See, one of the ways to make the ordinary extraordinary is simply to look at stuff more carefully. Just look at anything more carefully. A sure sign that you are actually not seeing something is that you recognize it. So you've seen your husband, your wife, your dog. Oh, there's Tootie the dog. I've seen. You're not really seeing beyond what you already know. In other words, you have an image. It matches with that dog. It must be your dog. But you're not really stopping to look. To find out what you're not seeing, look at it more closely. If you've been married 25 years, look at the side of your husband and your wife's face to the point of oddness. Look at anything to the point it's odd. Now, your left hand, you've seen your left hand many, many times. Look at it to notice anything you've never noticed before. And when you see anything, just go ooh, out, or make some kind of noise of acknowledgement. So look until you, we have some ooh and ah. Go ahead, Rich, said go. Ooh, wow, odd, ooh. Okay, this is a sophisticated group. I can't expect you to get into that. It's, it's New Jersey, and it's a very sophisticated state. I, I, I don't expect a lot of ooing and along without uh, 
you know, kind of getting into perhaps later this evening. Uh, how many would like your kids to be successful in the world? A show of hands? About 50%. I'm glad because <laughs> I find that very gratifying. All hands shot up, uh, you know, we're, we're filming, so all hands were raced into the air. Um, if they want to be successful in school, uh, reading, writing, and math are important. If they want to be successful in life, talking and listening are important, speaking and listening. Uh, so when I was a teacher, uh, one of the paradoxes was if I wanted the kids I was teaching to listen better, I had to let them talk more. I'll say that again. If I wanted to listen better, I had them talk more. So when I was working with kids, I only talked for the length of the age of the child. So if I was working with eight-year-olds, I only went for, you know, eight minutes. And, you know, 12-year-olds, 12 minutes. And then I'd stop and I'd say, okay, partner one, talk to partner two about everything you've learned so far. And they'd have to talk about it. And this would go for about a minute, and then after a minute, I'd make a little sound, it went like this. <laughs> then they'd have 15 seconds, and then <laughs> totally quiet. It's cool, isn't it? I sell these, these are a million dollars each. I have one. And you have them, they're fantastic, they're very good. And worth the million bucks. Child would have gone to college, but instead they have a nice balsa whistle. I think that's a, a good thing. Getting kids to talk, but what I get kids to do is talk, but only for a minute and 15 seconds. So in other words, you have to be able to self-express and self-control. Self-express and self-control. Now, I know, just looking at you, that you have really, really great, smart, incredible children. I can tell just by looking. I get the feeling. I just I get the sense. Of, but here's something that took me about 35 years to learn. In life, it's not enough to be interesting. It's important to be interested. I say that from painful life experience, going to parties and being very interesting, because I had a pretty good IQ, and not getting invited back a whole lot. <laughs> and then I was, wait, knock, knock, wake up, Mr. John. Be interesting 10% of the time, interested 90% of the time. A winning combination for really, really bright kids. Does that make sense? I had to hold myself back a lot, but it was okay. And in my life, people had said two things about me regularly. He's too intense and he's weird. <laughs> intense and weird. Well, I looked up weird. Weird has an ancient Celtic root that means he or she who's found her destiny. So I would hope for each of you that your child finds their weird. Finds their weird. It's one of my passions. When I was teaching, with all of the pressure on, on accountability and no child left behind and, and assessment and, blah, 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 and all of that, I always thought, look, the curriculum is always going to be in service to the kid, not the other way around. My North Star was, I want you to be more you-like. And I will use the curriculum to help you be more you-like, not the other way around. I don't want you to be more like the curriculum so it meets my needs. Does that make sense? There's a brilliant guy named Kenneth Robinson. Ever heard of Ken Robinson? Well, he's a great guy. You can, you can go to YouTube, TED Talks, whatnot. <laughs> he basically said, when we're educating children, just two things, just two things. So he wrote a book called The Element. And this is how it is, very, very simply. Look at your kids. And when I say, everything I say about your kids, it applies to you also. It's not just your kids. It's not always just for your kids. It's you. Ask yourself and watch your kids to find out what they love to do and what they do best. I'll say that again. What you love to do and what you do what? Best. Now, in a moment, I'm going to show you how to motivate your kids anytime, any place, anywhere, forever. So raise your hand if you'd like to learn that. Way cool. Okay, now you're going to want it more than that, so what I'm going to do is this. In a moment, I'm going to close my eyes, and you will become mad, wild, gerbil-like entities because you will be pretending to be a caged gerbils scratching at a, at a mesh screen for your freedom, like this. <laughs> like that. I will close my eyes so that you, because you're very sophisticated, I'm sure you're all professional, sophisticated people, but I want to hear, uh, and again, remember, we're going for that award for best table. And also best side of the room. This side versus that side. Okay, so I close my eyes. Let's go for about three seconds. Raise your hand if you're willing to let go and do this. Hey, kids. Don't make me turn this bus around. Uh, okay, all right. One, two, three. Hey, listen. 
It's a little early, maybe you don't want to get into it, that's okay. But here's my point. It's wonderful when you get your real self come out and sometimes lose it sometimes. And kids like it when you become like an animal for a second. What happens is you remind yourself that, hey, I was a kid once too. Does that make sense? A little scary because we live in a world that seems to say, okay, let's be important and successful, important and successful. And it's important to be important and successful. It's more important to be real and fulfilled. There are many successful, and you guys look terribly successful. There are many successful people. But I always thought when I was teaching kids, I was not going for success. I was going for fulfillment. Because there are some, I've seen miserable, successful people, but I've never seen a miserable, fulfilled person. And I've said to teachers all over the country, I don't care if kids learn to read. Now, if they, if they just snip that apart and out of context, I'd never work again. <laughs> I don't care if kids learn to read. I care that they learn to love to read. I don't care if kids learn to write. I care that they love to write. Now, it's different learning to read and learning to love to read. You got to do some very unusual tactics to get kids to love to read and learning to write the same thing. And I'm going to be showing you some of those tactics tonight. But first, I wanted to start with the mystery of the senses. Now, after the senses, children then move into the imagination. Because what children do better than anyone on the planet, and which is the core of their giftedhoodness, is that they observe and they imagine. They observe and they what? They imagine. Because they have to wait a lot. They're, they're, they're put on hold. You know, you're talking to your aunt, your sister, whatever. Excuse me, you want to go to the car? Then, no, 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 don't touch that. Just wait. Mother's not, dad's not. I'm not done talking. Just wait. Just wait. Just, no, no, no. Don't, don't. Just wait. Wait. <laughs> Does that seem familiar? <laughs> so a lot of times kids are put on hold and when you're just, just wait, don't touch that, wait. There are only two things left, observation and imagination. <laughs> About stuff that you would normally overlook. For example, that scratch on grandma's elbow that looks like an odd crescent. Here's a gifted child looking up at grandma's elbow for about 45 minutes while the talking keeps going on and on and on about really important stuff, income tax, Al-Qaeda, blue state, red state, whatever, governors, whatever. Now, oh man, that scar, I wonder how grandma got that. Is she involved with like a motorcycle gang or something? It's cool, man, I could kind of see it, you know, like a bandana, something like a patch, a pirate. Weird, she was a pirate, man, grandma's a pirate, I can see that, man. Hey, Miatis! I can see Grandma stabbing somebody in the heart with, a, with one of those, with a pike. Yeah, no, I can't. I actually can't see that. Grandma, you ever been a private or robbed a bank? No, why do you ask? Well, you got that weird crescent. Oh, I cut that uh, cutting flowers. Says, oh, did you really? Very interesting. <laughs> Kids are observing stuff like little tiny vacuum cleaners picking up on every little bit of lint. Not lint, amazing little things. And what makes them so brilliant is they see stuff we have all, long ago overlooked. They look at stuff we look for. Honey, where are the scissors? The scissors. Honey, scissors. Adults look for stuff. Where are the keys, the scissors, the hat, the driveway, Princeton University, uh, the library, whatever. And they look at grandma's elbow, a foot, a shoe, a something like that. What are they thinking? So what do you do when you go off? What are you looking at a tile for for five minutes? <laughs> Little kids will look at a green light for an hour and a half. What are you looking at? I'm looking at God. I'm looking at heaven. I'm looking at beauty. I'm looking at something you cannot ever, ever put into words because it's sensory. You can't really describe dead man's face. Just ooey, weird, soft. If you're working with gifted kids, and you are, don't have them describe it in three words. Have them go about 45 words deep. Like, this is soft, furry, bound. Now, after I get three, it's okay. But try to describe it with about 75 words. Getting kids to articulate is the surest sign of appearing intelligence. There are two big red flags for intelligence. Now, sometimes it's looking smart is as important as being smart in, in our society. Have you noticed that? And here are two ways. One is choice of words. Not big words, choice. How many read The uh, Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck? Fourth grade vocabulary, brilliantly chosen. Every word impeccably chosen. The smokestack muttered on the truck. It's brilliant. He spent five years looking, 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 and three months writing. He wrote it in 100 days. He got the Nobel Prize for Literature. Thank you, John. Migrant workers, very simple language, very well chosen. So the two red flags are, number one, choosing words, articulate. 
So here's a mom talking to her child. I want you to clean up your room, clean up the patio, clean up the backyard, clean up the, then we can go to Disneyland, okay? That's one mom. <laughs> here's another one. I want you to rake the leaves, sweep the front room, swab the top, ice the cake, blow dry the whatever. What's the difference between those? Somebody's actually articulating specificities, speak more in specific and stretch the language rather than generalize things. And the second red flag is knowing something about art. Like over there, that door looks like a Tontinelli. Tontinelli, that doesn't look like a Tontinelli. Frank Tontinelli? No, Frank Dayton Tontinelli? Make up a name. It's like a Catantinelli. It looks like a, I was listening to Haydn coming in today. I wasn't, I was listening to something else. But knowing something about the arts and sharing it, or knowing something specific and saying it it's very specific, comes across as very intelligent. I used to train sixth graders to get summer work just by using a couple of phrases. You undoubtedly want punctuality, Mr. or Mrs. whatever, who's giving a job. Wow, what a bright kid. Because they assume the entire rest is very, very bright. Is that a hand? Yeah. Yes. I th my guess is that if you, whatever language it is, if you articulate in any language, it helps you, it helps you speak more uh, in, in, a, in, in a specific way. Does that make sense? The idea is, is as, I, as minutely as you can describe something, the better your language comes out. And one of the way, whether it's in, in any language, English or any other language, just being more detailed, if I were to give you your own personal gifted learning kit, would you like that? It's a very simple thing after watching lots and lots of gifted kids, super gifted kids, all kinds of kids. It's basically this. Really smart people do three things a lot, routinely, regularly. And if they do this naturally, they can do it better consciously, which means all kids can do it. And number one is really smart people tend to think in greater detail than other people. That's why when they listen to political stuff and whatnot, they don't automatically get the three second sound bite and be convinced. They realize there are things deeper than that and there's a bigger picture because they think in much greater detail about everything. Secondly, they have more questions about everything. Do your kids have lots of questions about stuff? Everything. Why are shoes shaped like this? Why are toes on the front of the feet? What is my neck actually colored? Is it all dark down there? What would happen if I ate a spider? Don't, don't, don't suggest that. Uh, but basically, you know, why are doors rectilinear? Two types of questions that are really, really great to have your kids do all the time. Number one, what if? And number two, what else? What if opens up new ground? What else? keeps it going further. So thinking in detail, asking more questions, those are the two, and the third is making weirder, wilder, deeper, bigger connections. So it's basically three things to keep in mind. Are you fostering thinking in detail more? Are you getting kids to ask questions more? And you don't have to answer all the questions. In fact, kids used to ask me a lot of questions. I just asked them more questions back. Why is the sky blue? I don't know. Why do molecules bond in a certain way they don't? In other words, why is water wet? What do, why do geese? You know, you could make up all kinds of questions. And then connection. So it's details, questions, and connections. Now, I want us to practice a little observation game just to get going. Uh, you have a partner. You've already got that partner. So I'm going to pretend my partner is, and your name is? Allison. Allison. Big hand for Allison. And Allison, you'll, you'll come off as heroic and whatnot. Allison is my listening partner right now because I'm going to look at an object. I, if I, I will not hurt this animal. I'll cut it in half. I'm not a magician. <clears throat> but I'm going to, in one minute, describe this, okay? Now, if I say it's lavender, it smells like cat fur, it's got some buttons on the top, I could name five or six things. That's not gifted. Gifted is naming 175 things. What it means is after you see one thing, it's lavender, stop looking at the lavender. Start looking at something else, 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 else. Gifted kids are really good at staring at something, looking at stuff and finding more and more and more, not only in an object, but in their thoughts, their feelings, and whatnot. So to practice this detailed business, I'm going to have you have a partner. Now, the partner is a trained listening partner. What does that mean? They have a warm listening face. And incidentally, we don't listen with our ears. We listen with our face. A pleasant face opens doors. 
So gifted kids need to know that interesting is good, interested is also good, and a warm, pleasant face. Because I used to have kids with 100, an IQ of 180 listening to kids with an IQ of 80, and the child with the IQ of 80 just felt smarter because they were being listened to more deeply by a really smart person who was not leaping in and interrupting. Does that make sense? Because it's a really cool thing to have all that power of intelligence and simply listen. It conveys such respect and dignity. So you always have to rush in with the answer. So what's going to happen is I'm going to have you get your partner. And if we get in a threesome, that's OK. And decide who's partner one and who's partner two. So just decide who's partner one, who's partner two, and just go ahead. And, and partner one, please put up a hand. Partner one, a hand. Cool, partner one, a hand. Uh, wave, uh, say go Raiders, Raiders, love you Raiders. Okay, perfect, now partner two, a fist. And say go San Francisco 49ers, next year. <laughs> Colin Kaepernick, why couldn't they have won? Ugh. Excuse me, I lost something. I lost my supper for a second. Partner two, you're the listener, and partner one, all you're gonna do is pick up an object, could be anything, and you're gonna name everything you can see. Now, you're only gonna have 30 seconds, and then I'm gonna go, and then you're only gonna have five seconds, and then I'm gonna go, and when I go, you have to be totally what? Totally quiet. Now. We need to practice self-expression and self-control both. So that's talk, 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 and then stop on a dime. Also, the listener may have the more powerful job because your job is simply to listen. A couple of techniques about listening. A really cool thing. When you listen to somebody, just pick an eye and look searchingly into the one eye. You have some angry people in your life. Don't look at their angry face and get intimidated. Pick an eye and look at the eye. They can be as angry as they want. You'll just be vacationing into their left eye. Here's another listening technique. If somebody's angry at you, not that they would be, not in New Jersey, why would they? Here's the, this, this will add five years to your life. Are you ready for this one? I just, it struck me the other day, and I, I, just, I think it's very fun. When you think, oh, Bill or Susan or whoever's angry at me, I, I, I imagine their face being 18 feet by 18 feet chasing me down a street. So instead, I make a little, I make a switch. In my head, I say, Bill's brain is angry at me. Everything chills out. Hey, it's physiological, not psychological. I'm not to blame. His brain is angry. So Tina's brain is angry. My son's brain is angry. Not, I'm not a bad dad. My son's brain is angry at me. Well, that's cool. It's his brain. It has a right to be whatever. So look at people's eyes. Don't buy the face. Check, check, check out the eye. And if somebody's angry, it's not their face. It's their brain. Ooh, a brain. It's physiological. Does that make sense? Now, partner one, you'll be looking at the object. You can name, name, name. The world record is... 14 things. If you go more than 14 things, and, and actually the, the trick is to take a simple thing and pull out more things. If you had a wad of keys, you could have a thousand things. But take something simple. We're going to go for the record. You make more than 14? And Matt, what have we got for them? I think we've got a Rolls Royce. No, we, the, the truck didn't make it. We will not have the Maserati or the Rolls Royce. Instead, you'll have a feeling. Stop that. You'll have a feeling of yummy goodwill. So partner one, take an object and describe it like this. And partner two, all you do is watch and be a warm listening partner. Ready, set, go. And you need to get up. You got a part, you can be a, you can be in a threesome there. Once, if you hear my voice, clap once. Raise your hand if you enjoyed that. Perfect. Raise your hand if you didn't enjoy that. Perfect. Here's another way to add years to your life. Whatever it is, it's perfect. Love what is and work around it. So it's perfect. Who discovered something by virtue of simply looking more closely? Anyone? Yeah.
Wow, all right. So looking at it, you notice little things. I've had people have look at a watch they've had forever and notice stuff they've never seen. Typically what happens is children look at things as never before. Adults tend to look at things as ever before. So just make a little switch. Look at things a little longer. And when you're talking to somebody, when they say something, stop and give them a full second of silence before you say anything. It'll add a sense of gravitas. Even if the, what is it called, Wawa. We have seven lines of Wawa. What an interest. I love that name, the Wawa. You want uh, lids on these? No, I wouldn't. 1001. Dignity. Now, you got a chance to observe a little technique that I learned from a brilliant guy named Win Winger is a thing called image streaming, where you look at something and you just go as fast as you can naming everything you can possibly see. You can do it with an object, you can do it with an imagining. Watch this. I'm going to do it with uh, George Washington crossing the Delaware. I'm imagining that famous painting of George Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, I see George Washington, he's got one leg up, the, fl uh, the, the flag is kind of bent down right here. There are about five or six guys in the boat. He's wearing some kind of tan breeches and a blue coat. It's freezing cold. His, his expression is changing. He's getting a furrowed brow. He's getting an unfurrowed brow. It's very dark outside. It's very ice cold. Uh, the British are waiting on the other side. He could be slaughtered, but he's not sure. He's very scared, but he's standing there balancing because he could fall off into the icy, icy water. It's about 4 o'clock in the morning. Now, I don't know how accurate I am. But for a second, I just, I channeled, I went back there. Does that make sense? When you image stream something, like look at an object and name it nonstop, nonstop, tonight you'll remember me, you'll remember this evening, the, the wonderful people, but this thing will come crashing into your head. Why? Because you put words to it. When we name stuff, something in the brain says, this must be important, we're putting words to it. Does that make sense? Now, a little later, I'm gonna show you how you can develop a photographic memory for your kids. Is that okay? in the world's easiest way, it's a great thing. And when they do, they'll all be able to go to Princeton. How's that? Sound good? Guaranteed. Sort of. Now, partner one, you practice observation. And partner number two, you're going to practice imagination. And here's how it works. I'm going to take this wonderful iPhone. I will not hurt the iPhone, Jen. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk, again, nonstop, only I'm going to make up either a succession of stories triggered by whatever's here or one long story. Is that okay? And if you want, you can actually start with the words once upon a time just to add some kind of, you know, funness to it. Uh, but I'm not going to. Uh, this, the rim here reminds me of the swimming pool. I used to swim as a kid uh, in Los Altos, California. Uh, and the smell of chlorine, I'll never forget that horrible smell, and all those rules at the swimming pool, don't run, don't ski, don't knife anyone, don't pour gasoline, don't set the place on fire, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. Uh, on the back of this little opening right here, it looks like, uh, looks like an outhouse act. Remember one of those old, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, Hatfields and McCoys thing, the old out with the, with the moon. Let's go. This white little thing looks like a diamond. I've got a girlfriend. She often takes me to jewelry stores. I think that's a hint of some kind. Uh, she's really cool, and who knows? I may be tracking toward a diamond without my ning ning pulling to uh, There's a dark pitch black here, which reminds me of the dark of night. Now, I jumped around. Did I keep on talking? I could have followed one line of thinking, or I could have jumped around and had a lot of things. What happens is, thank you, Jim. In school, we often try to get kids to think creatively by being too general, in my estimation. If you ask a child, how was your summer? It's like asking you, how were the last 25 years? Uh, 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 which part? But kids are brilliant at looking at small things and expanding downward, inward, inward in any language. Does that make sense? Because you can do this in any language. So now, partner one who had the benefit of talking first, now you're going to be all ears, or not all ears, all warm smile face. As partner number, whoever the opposite partner is, will be telling, so does it have to be true? I don't know. What's truth? Make it up. Whatever you want. Go someplace. But it's not out of the ether. It's by looking at something specific. So raise your hand if you're ready to do this. Perfect. Now, again, we're only going to go for, this time, 45 seconds. That doesn't mean stop. It means you got five seconds. Ready, set, tell stories. Ready, set, go.
give yourselves a hand okay uh, anybody like to share what were some things you liked or learned any things you like first of all reach down if you enjoy doing that perfect raise your hand if you didn't perfect now the reason I'm starting with an object is you, see here's the deal if kids can observe and imagine and, and, and they're doing that anyway, but if they can consciously do what they naturally have to do, it's your own, their own personal genius kit. What it means is you can look at things very, very closely and come out with things, either by what you really, really see minutely, which most people don't do, and let stories just come and come based on whatever's in front of you. And if you don't know what to say, look at something else and let yourself triggered. Does that make sense? I have had people take a pair of glasses and, and come up with stuff they would never think of talking about, and it's just revelatory, if that's a word. It is now. Um, anybody have any, anything like to share? Anybody want to share? A, oh, here's a thought. When I was a teacher, I used to point to kids like this. This is a gun. This is St. Francis of Assisi. You, 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 you. In fact, Bring a little Shakespeare, a little Renaissance into your home. When you come home, instead of saying, hi, I'm home, go like this, say, I'm home. <laughs> Try to say, say, I'm home. I'm home. In brain theory and, and retention, people remember beginnings and endings better than anything else. So when you come home and you see whoever's there, get really happy in a minute, really at first, and then you can do whatever you want. And at the end, happy and whatnot. And you can use the full voice. Honey, I'm home. I'm home. It's a fun thing. I don't do that. Anybody have anything to share from the imagining piece? Is, is that a hint? No, I guess not. Okay, perfect. Raise your hand if this is useful. It will become more so. Okay, perfect. Now I'm going to finish the little chart, then I'm going to share how to become, how to develop a photographic memory. But first, before I do that, here's a Pearsonism. In your house, turn all waiting, wanting, worrying, or whining. I'll say, not that there would be whining in your house. <laughs> waiting, wanting, and they kind of go together. Waiting, wanting, worrying, or wanting into watching. If kids can learn to watch, it takes them out of their head into other things. A lot of times kids get in a bad mood because there's this dominant thought, no, no, I'm angry, I don't like my sister, I don't like my sister, I don't like my, well, you can say, honey, stop, you know, thinking about your sister. That'll last for about four seconds. All right, I'm not thinking about my young sister. No. <laughs> so instead of don't think, just see something. A picture will block an auditory thing. So see something. So instead of, I don't, just stop thinking and just start looking at stuff really. Why, don't, why am I looking at this chair? Just to get my mind off my sister. Cool. <laughs> Also, get kids to realize that they can actually not only observe things in the world more closely, to take themselves out of their own head. Does that make sense? As a practice, as a discipline, as a mastery, they can also see things inside their head, namely their thoughts. Here's a huge thought. Don't think of your thoughts as thoughts. Kind of a zen thing. But I come from California. It's a zen thing. Think of your thoughts as fish. And your head, the most expensive, amazing, miraculous aquarium ever made. So when you have a thought, I don't like that person. Ooh, ooh, that's not a thought. That's a fish. I like to write, and I was asked uh, to write a piece uh, for my relationship with my beautiful, wonderful, brilliant girlfriend in Los Angeles at a, at a public reading uh, with lots of people, I guess, and a theater piece, and write something. Excuse me, I was trying to brag there for a second. So I'm sitting down to write because I love to write, and I've written two big giant novels which are gathering dust someplace and a billion short stories. So I'm starting to write something about this woman that I, who I really love, and a voice comes into my head, clear as anything, and it says, whatever I write is going to be junk. I said, wait a sec, there's a scary thought. And then the next thought after that was, no, whatever I write is going to be good, and I'll be showing off. And that was my mother's voice from years ago. And then the third one was, what am I bothering? I should be doing something to earn some money right now, instead of messing around with this, this Valentine's Day thing. I realized, ooh, thank you, brain, for sharing. Now I know it's been ruling me for so long. It's not going to be good enough. 
if it is good enough, I'm bad, da -da -da -da, I should be earning money. Now, the thing is, when kids can realize, oh, just, just a thought floating by, then they don't have to be at effect. Does that make sense? I mean, I mean, sages have been saying this for eons and eons, but my point is, something as simple as looking at an object can be turned into looking at your emotions, can be turned into looking at your feelings, and then you can turn all waiting, wanting, worrying, whining into what I notice, I get upset. Okay, with that, I have more awareness. Now, stamp your feet if that makes sense. Okay, now, you see this chair that I put over here? Uh, it's hard not to see it. Um, about a number of years ago, I'll put it over here, you can see it better. Um, I was working with, the, I do a lot of school assemblies, and I pretended I was in front of uh, 300 K to third graders, and I pretended that we had a visitor. His name was Buck. He's a dinosaur. He has a red hat, a yellow bow tie, a blue shirt, a green belt, orange pants, pink socks, purple shoes. It's about eight things. Could you remember all eight things? Well, the kids, the K to third graders in South Central LA, were listening to me with their neck. It was like this. And I thought, well, you know, they're not going to get it, but I'm having fun. And then as a joke, I said, and actually, instead of doing eight things, I did 35 things. I went on and on and on and on. And as a joke, I said, you know, what colors Buck's hat? Two-thirds of the kids who'd been listening with their neck roared back red. What colors the bow tie? Yellow. They went through all 36 things. And the teachers who had been correcting homework around the perimeter of the room were putting pins. I said, this is Torella. She can't remember her lunch money. But she remembers 87 things in a row. At the end of the assembly, I said, Buck wants to thank you all. You got some handouts. Buck had a great time being here. What color was his hat? This time, two-thirds of them didn't remember. Three-quarters of them did. And the reason is, pictures go in, excuse me, words go in, words go out, pictures stay. Words go in, words go out, pictures what? Stay. And I can prove that. If I were to say to you, what were you like when you were nine years old, your brain goes on an image search, not a text search. You don't get a page of text. We lived in Michigan. It was hard. Dad was angry that morning. <laughs> you get imagery. And what happens is words come, words go with the pictures. So if you want kids to learn something, put it in pictures, put it in stories. Put it in pictures, put it in stories. And some of the best pictures and stories you can do for kids are before and after stories. I used to be this, now I'm that. I hate to read. I used to hate to read. Now, I love to read. That's different than, oh, you're going to love to read. No, I don't. I was a substitute teacher for three years in the LA County Juvenile Hall System. Kids would say, I hate math. And my rule of thumb was always agree at the start. You ever heard of the, the concept of entrainment? The way entrainment works is if you have two clocks of pendulums and they're going out of sync, just on a wall, they will sync up. So here's a little thing. If you're watching people at a cafeteria or something, somebody scratches their head, within a minute, the other person unconsciously will scratch their head. So here's what I did. If kids are leaning to the left while talking to me, I lean to the left. If they're talking in three words, I talk in three words. I just mimic. Something's, oh, he must be one of us. Because he's like that thing. Don't make a big deal out of it, otherwise they'll think you've gone to a workshop and learned a really cool technique. <laughs> Entrainment, it's a fun thing. Now, uh, with Buck the Dinosaur, uh, we think in pictures, and I, and I know we think in pictures. Uh, how many drove here tonight? Good, because I had to go, I had to drive out and get something and drive back, and I scratched someone's car, I don't know who, but. Uh, Oops. No, it's, it's, it wasn't, it's not a dance, it's a scratch. Like, so not just about, what about yay? How many of you are now picturing your car? How many of you now hate me and won't listen to a thing? The truth is I didn't scratch anyone's car, but see, had I moved on to talk about other stuff, you would have had that car, 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 car. Because pictures have a shelf life. They change. You tell a story to a child and their mouth is, <gasps> that picture will keep on going and going and going for hours and hours. Does that make sense? This was me in kindergarten. Somebody told me the story about Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. The class moved on, and I could not get past, first of all, the name. Humpty Dumpty. What kind of a name would somebody, Humpty Dumpty? Who, was, who were his parents? And what is a, a, an egg doing wearing pants? And then falling backwards to your death? That seemed worse than falling forward to your death. And then non-existence, then being hollow inside. And then, the big one that I still haven't re figured out, 
all the king's horses and all the king's men, all the king's horses, were trying to put Humpty together again. What the heck were the horses doing? We got a problem. We can't hey, bring in the horse. The horse. The horse. So I always had these little, what is that? Why? I, I had this huge interior world. Gifted kids have huge interior worlds. If we have too simplified systems of assessment and evaluation for kids who have huge worlds, it's an insult to their interior world. Does that make sense? So it means that once in a while we need to be able to be creative. I say to teachers, clarity and understanding is very important. Mystery and surprise is equally important. Now, you guys have big imaginations, and we're going to prove it right now. I'd like you to imagine a cow. The cow's name is Georgette. What's the cow's name? Georgette. It's a Jersey cow. What kind of a cow? So please take your finger and say, I, I hold up my finger, I hold up my finger, I hold up my finger. and I draw the Empire State Building. Okay, cool. Now take both hands and feel the Empire State Okay, feel the radio tile. Okay, snap it off, throw it, throw it, eat it. No, no, don't eat the radio. Don't, don't do that. That would be... Oh, but go down the side and break in if you win. Rustle some papers, throw a couple of... Don't hit. Catch them before they hit people. Catch them, catch them. How many of you were able to do that? Way cool. So there was a cow, the cow's name was Georgette, it was a Jersey cow sitting on top of the, singing a couple of Christmas carols, singing a couple of what? Under its arm is a Virginia ham, what's under its arm? And the cow's wearing a pair of yellow underwear, what's the cow wearing? In its hoof is a pencil, what's in its hoof? And the cow is making a connect the dots drawing, what kind of a drawing? Of Marilyn Monroe, of who? Walking down a road, down a what? Going to mass, going to what? So what was the cow's name? Georgia. What kind of a cow was it? Jersey. Sitting on top of the, Empire singing a couple. Christmas. Under its arm is a, Virginia. cow's wearing a pair of, Yellow. in its hoof is a, it's making what kind of a drawing? Connect the dots of, Empire. walking down a, going to. Congratulations, you just learned all 13 original colonies. Georgia, New Jersey, New York, the Empire State Building, the Carolinas, Virginia, New Hampshire, Delaware, Underwear, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Connected Dots, Maryland, Rhode Island, and Mass, or how many would like a handout with that on it? <laughs> Actually, Matt, who stepped in at the perfect time, is going to run, uh, he's going to, I think, Matt, you're going to send out to people the, the big 17-page handout that has all of that, right? Am I right? Because Matt Mingo is a great, how about a big hand for Matt Mingo? Okay, so what color was the cow's underwear? Okay, now I'm going to draw a little picture. And Buck, if you'd hop down, hop down. Love you, Matt, but hop, not, I love you, but not the behavior. I'm serious. Don't eat that. You could choke. You could die. And then where would you be? That was a, that was a zen joke. Some of these I'll do just for myself. <laughs> okay, to finish the, finish the diagram, I began a long time ago. Things begin in the senses with children. All things begin in the senses, except two things you're built with. One is fear of loud noises and sudden falling. Other than that, you learned it. And you learned it through the senses, and then things move into the imagination. Kids have an amazing ability to hear your words and make their mental movie. To hear your words and make their mental what? And in a little bit, we're going to be shifting into how to, as I say, develop a photographic cinematic memory using that fact. So children live in the world of senses, imagination, and then emotion. Senses, imagination, and emotion. And this is where inspiration all comes from. The senses, the imagination, and the emotions. And healthy children live from the attitude of do it and see. Do it and what? And then we go to school and, uh, you know, we develop adult brains. I, even if we didn't go to school, we'd develop an adult brain. Your brain weighs three pounds. How about giving your brain a hand? See, nice brain. Good. Yeah, see? Because, cool. you know, three pounds just grows and grows. The amygdala, all kinds of parts, the cerebral cortex. Uh, and in school, I'll do this in adult colors. It's all about facts. It's all about understanding from the Latin to stand under. I just, I made that up. It was fun. And then judgment, judgment. We'll do it with an E, you can do it with an E, without an E, if you're English, if you're not English, whatever. Now, facts, understanding, and judgment are great, except some kids then switch into an attitude of don't do it unless you can do it what? Right? Or if you're gifted perfectly. So, 
The rest of the night is to show how you can teach facts, understanding, and judgment using senses, imagination, and emotion. Senses, imagination, and what? Perfect. What color was the cow's underwear? Guys are great. I'm trying to see which table will probably get the award for best audience member. It's perfect. Now I'm going to draw a little picture. This picture is called How to Learn All My Times Tables in One Minute. Such a powerful learning that you will get in the, in the next four minutes or so that uh, you'll be able to share everywhere. And if there's a family gathering, there's a lull in the conversation, you can fill the breach with this amazingly, if you're single, you can meet someone. It's a great thing. Want to see something really cool? This. It's so cool. Uh, yelps of pleasure, teardrops of joy. And I'm going to draw a little picture. And this picture is called How to Learn All My Times Tables in One Minute. Dooby dooby dayo, daffa daffa dayo. Thumb and a finger and a finger and a finger and a finger, yeah. Thumb and a finger and a finger and a finger and a finger, yeah. Pair of hands. See, if you don't draw well, draw poorly, happily well. Big fun. Cool. This is how to multiply everything from 6 to 10. From 6 to what? 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now, I'm doing 6 to 10 because 6 to 10 are the tricky ones. I need to get a volunteer to hold the mic because I will need both hands free. Is somebody would like to participate and receive $5. <laughs> Perhaps just participate. Anybody like to participate? Oh, Chip, big hand for Chip. Five bucks. Five bucks. I'd like to hold, get five bucks for holding that mic, but. I thought you were going to pull out five bucks. You're going to pull out five bucks? I'll give you more than five bucks because I don't measure it in money. I measure it in a warm feeling inside. The feeling that you would get by being inner directed and whatever. Now, Chip, perhaps we'll work out that five bucks after all. Now, I'd like us all to try this because if one, per one, one person doesn't in the room, it sucks energy from the entire building. Say, I, I, I hold my hands out in a push-up. Can you guys see? And Chin, you don't have to because you're on the mic. Thanks, but you're, great. you're a great person. See, the, the, the need to, 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 it's a great. Say, I, I, I wiggle my sixes, seven, eight, nine, ten, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, now we're halfway there. Both hands in there say, math is cool at our school. Now that's called a low-level success plateau moment. Don't tell your kids it's a low-level success plateau. But success has to do with plateauing. So shrink to the level of success and then inch back out. In any endeavor, shrink to the level and then inch back out. So now we're halfway done. Now we're going to multiply 7 times 7. What is 7 times 7? A little hesitant. 49. Now we're going to try to say, I... I touch a seven to a seven like so. And Chin, if you'd hold this up, I'm going to fall into you if you're not careful. <laughs> Say I. I touch a seven to a seven like so. It makes a roof. There you go. I scrunch the roof down. See how that looks like a roof scrunch? Now you have a scrunch. All the fingers in the scrunch each get ten points. How many points? And you've got four fingers, so how many total points? I can't hear you. 40. And the fingers sticking up, they're the ones. They're the what? And they're lonely, so we're going to multiply them. So 3 times 3 is 9. So 40 plus 9 is 49. Can we have a chumba? Chumba. Now, in slow motion, 7 times 8. Say, I. I touch a 7 to an 8, like so. Scrunch it down. Down, there you go. <laughs> Five fingers in the scrunch. How many points do you have? Fifty. And then two times three is six. So it's fifty-six. So seven times eight is fifty-six. Eight times eight equals sixty-four. Put an eight on an eight. Close the door. That's sixty. And two times two is four. Eight times eight is six. Six times six. This is tricky, but you guys are smart. We just live a couple of blocks from Albert Einstein's old house. Say I. I touch a 6 to a 6, like so. It makes a 20. There you go. See how that makes 20? And then 4 times 4 is 16. So 20 plus 16 is 36. Now it goes like this. You go touch and scrunch the tens. Multiply and add the ones. Touch and scrunch the tens. 
multiply and add the ones. Uh, Chen, thank you so much, and you may have a seat. Incidentally, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why do we have bright kids learning how to do math on their fingers? I don't want your kids doing math on their fingers when they're 45 years old, but what happens is it makes it into a little game, and even gifted kids can be phobic about certain areas of the curriculum. Does that make sense? So when I was a teacher, my whole thing was to turn every rule into a game en route to an art. I'll say that again. A rule turns into a game en route to an art, which means en route to mastery. So this is a funny little goofy thing. It's called touch and scrunch the tens, multiply and add the ones. Now, I'd like you to get a partner, and if you end up in a threesome, that's okay. You've got exactly one minute to teach each other how to do the touch and scrunch. Now, you can't go like, you can't say, I know. You must demonstrate the knowledge. Ready, set, go. Teach each other how to do the touch and scrunch. Okay, give yourselves a hand, give yourselves a hand. Uh, way cool. You know, if you want the algebra, if you want the algebra, it's right here. 10 times x minus 5 times, uh, plus y minus 5, blah, blah, blah. It's the algebra. I worked that out the other day just for fun doing that. Now, this is hand x, that's hand y. See, with gifted kids, you can do things that are remedial and then bump it up into something that's rather extraordinary. So I ask kids, what's the algebra? Why does it work? How does it work? Where did it come from? What do you think? Who developed this? Why would they develop it? And develop some kind of metacognition, asking kids further questions. So this is kind of simple in a way, but it's also a cool game. The next thing is to find out what is it, how is it, why is it? See, most people stop short and they don't ask. They see what? They live in a world of what? What, what, what? They don't think how, and they rarely think why. I see this, I see that, I see phenomena. How does it work? I haven't thought that far. Why? What's going on on the why? Part? So getting kids to think what is good, but how and why is way better. So why does that work? Think about that. Getting your kids to live on the level of what, how, and why is very empowering. Now, what color was that cow's underwear? Did it help you to talk to somebody about this process? Yeah, now what I've discovered is, when I was a teacher, everything I taught had an academic, an artistic, and a social component. An academic, an artistic, and a social. An academic, an artistic, and a social. Now, what happened was, when it had all of those, it had an emotional, and a sensory, and an imaginative component built in. Now, why do I do that? because I think it has way more impact. Way more what? I remember back in high school, remembering this, I, I, I was working with te the teachers today in Hillsborough, and I recalled something from high school, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Avogadro's number, remember that? A mole of air, a little mole of air, the, amount of, the number of molecules in a little box of air. So, I've often felt this, that if you want to go from the verbal to the visceral, you have to pass through the visual. From the verbal to the visceral, how many are still thinking about your car? Because even though I said I didn't scratch one, part of you is thinking, I'm going to check. I'm checking, pal. I'm checking, man. I'm checking. But noise came from. 
6.02 times 10 to the fourth, that's, that's a very big number. Do you agree that that's a very big number? See, no, n none of that looks big. Six is small, two, zero, 10, 20, nothing's big. It's like saying mayonnaise and mayonnaiser. It's more mayonnaise-y. I don't get any feeling. So I'm gonna describe what it's like. It's like this. Kindly take your hands and feel a box of air about like this size and say, I, I, I feel a cube of air. A cube of air. A mole of air. Now, now that you've felt the cube, this is how big it is. If every one of those molecules were an unpopped kernel of popcorn, unpopped, you know how small those are? It would form a layer that would cover the entire United States of America in a blanket nine miles deep. Now, when it's, I read this the other day, I, when I got to the Bible, a layer covering America, my jaw dropped open. And when it said nine miles deep, my head blew off. I pointed out to a friend of mine, I said, he says, oh, that's cool. I call it the bigness of little. He says, John, that's cool. Here's the littleness of big. He said, if you hold a grape, try this tonight, you know, imagine a grape. You hold up a grape to the night sky at, at, at arm's length. The, the little patch of blackness that it blots out, the number of stars out there in that little patch of blot, the black little, the size of a, a grape this close blots out half the sky. But there, the little patch, between 10 and 15,000 galaxies, each one with about 100 billion stars. You've got 100 billion cells in your brain. So isn't this a cool universe? We were getting off on chairs and thin air a moment ago. Now, uh, so the question is, why is the night sky so confounded black if there's so much uh, Because it's so big, the light hasn't reached us yet. And now my head once again blows off the top of my head. <laughs> why is this important? Because if you can make a picture and speak from a picture, you can tell way better stories. If you can tell way better stories, you have a more powerful life. You're more persuasive in every, every way. I live in California. You live very close to New York. So 9-11, you were right here. I listened on the radio. I heard it was a terrible thing. The buildings have been struck by airplanes. I heard terrible. I said, terrible? But that's not a picture. Terrible is not a picture. People say it's terrible if they spill coffee on their pants. Here's the gut feeling, seeing people, then I turned on the TV. That got terrible. People jumping, holding hands in suits off the 83rd floor. That was, that's not terrible. My head blows off. So if you really want to persuade people, talk in pictures, talk in stories. Now, what kind of pictures, what kind of stories? Before we do the photographic memory, um, this is in your handout. Also, it's in this, I did a yellow book uh, that I'll show you at the end. It's, it's a cool book, and here you can get them tonight. They're 5,000 bucks, they do their 10 bucks. Way cool. They're, they're over their weight. Buck, don't eat the book, because I don't eat it. You'll choke, you'll die. Buck has moved over the book. Don't sit on it. Love you, but not be here. No ice cream, no ice cream. That always does it. Dinosaurs don't eat ice cream. Well, he does. Now, this is everybody's motivation. So if we have time, I'd go on to this for about 45 minutes. I'm going to do it in about one minute, okay? Children don't listen with their They don't listen with their interests. They listen with their deep down, dormant, buried passions. So how do you find out what their passions are? Very simple. You take a piece of paper and you write the word fun. The word what? And if we had more time, we'd do this, but you guys are way smart. You get the idea. It's in the handout. Matt's going to give the full 17-pager. It's all spelled. So you just relax and watch this. I put the word fun. What's the word? Fun. And I make a list of everything I do for fun. I like to read, eat, sleep, nap, run. Now you make a list that's vertical, and don't put eight things, put like 375 things. Here's number 180, I like doing this. 
I like actually walking out to the car like James Bond. I can't see myself, so why not be James Bond? I imagine background music as I approach the car. I feel heroic. I pretend that my face is the face of the young Warren Beatty. I was talking to teachers today, and they didn't know who Warren Beatty was because it was from the early 20s. And felt a nice young woman made me feel very, very old, and that was all right, but that's okay too. Comes with a certain wisdom. Uh, I had to get directions out to the school. Yes, I was, I was, I was at Princeton, and I, was, I needed to get, and my computer was not working, so I went into the, into the student lounge there and met a young man. I said, look, could we Google from X to Y, and, because I'm, I'm an educator. I said, I thought educator would do the thing, because, you know, I'm just, just off the street asking for a favor. I'm an educator. And apparently that worked. He said, sure. So we, and then after he gives me the directions out to the school, I say, because it suddenly occurred to me that I'm much older than he is, so I said to him, thank you, I really appreciate that, sir. I shall grant you three wishes. Because I felt like, like, like an elf or like a wizard. I shall grant you three wishes. Can we get, get to do that? I shall grant you three wishes. He says, well, yeah, I'd like to do better on my midterms. So I looked right into his face and I said, done. <laughs> and a beautiful girlfriend and to live to be about 500 years old, fully abundant in all ways. Dun, dun, dun. And then I left, you know, with, you know, with the directions. That's the way I call it. That's number 280. Find ways to have fun. See, if you'd like your kids to land on their feet, and if you heard nothing else from tonight, this would be the one thing. If it were my dying breath, this would be my dying breath. Your kids will land on their feet if they do two things. If they learn to do what is fun or bring fun into what they have to do, and if they learn to be of service. Have fun, be of service. Now, well, not everything's fun. Of course, not everything's fun. That's where you gotta bring fun into it. Does that make sense? So find out what you do well, what you do best, and teach to your strength. Constantly be teaching. And here's a nice ritual for parents. On Saturday or Sunday, sit down for 10 minutes, and the whole family sits together, and they write down all the victories you've had that week as a family and individually. Does that make sense? All the victories and then next, a list of everything you did this week that worked. If your kids start tracking for victories and what works, everything gets better because what they do and don't get any credit for, a lot of what works is restraint. I didn't punch my sister, she deserved it. Well, that's good, Jerry, now you get credit. You didn't punch her, I'm sure she's a very nice person. But the point is, self-restraint will serve you well in life. So now, we get track of what you do well, and all with it, what do I do well? Because you can't think, what's working, what's working, what's... Most people do the opposite. It's not working. If you listen to people, not you guys, but lesser people elsewhere, <laughs> a lot of the stories are not empowering. Stuff that's wrong, doesn't work. And you know that guy the other day, I said, you know, whatever, like that. There are stories that trap us and the stories that free us, but there are stories. Now, before I move on to the really meaty part, uh, in the last stage, we get some actual do these brain powers. I'd like you all please to stand up because you've had a, a long day and it's time to take a bit of a stretch and whatnot. And I'd like you to kind of stand up and, and stretch. Um, uh, that's, that's very good. Uh, I'd like you to roll your shoulders if you kind of roll the shoulders. Clap a couple, maybe a couple of arf sounds like a seal. Arf, 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 arf. There you go. Okay, perhaps not like a seal, perhaps not like an arf. Uh, this is a little thing I call creating room envy. Now we're going to pretend that there are people on either side in rooms. There aren't, but we'll pretend. And here's how it works. On the count of three, we go, yeah, 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 just screaming, yes, yes, in a big cheer. This will go for about five seconds, and then down. Raise your hand if you're in on this. Now, rather than do a hollow, empty, yeah, 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 think of something in your belly that is a yes. Perhaps it is that all of your kids have wonderful, fulfilled lives full of love and abundance and health and there's peace in the Middle East and, and somehow Congress works and somehow the economy takes off and whatever. Or maybe it's just you love your dog more. But get a yes. When you have the yes, put up a hand and say, I have the yes. Okay, now, when you yell, it's not an empty yeah. But think about it really coming true and just going, yes. So ready, set, go. Yeah! Again, yeah! Have a seat. Now you can do a thing in a restaurant called table envy. 
Pretend that somebody has told a funny joke. I'll pretend you told a really funny joke. And we all go, ha, 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 ha. Do that a couple of times. Everybody in the rest will wish they were at the good table. They'll say, oh, what was so funny? And you say, oh, you, you had to have been there. You had to have been there. God's truth. So for waiting for funny to happen, we may be waiting a long time. But remember, I said earlier, don't wait for the party. You are the party. What color was the cow's underwear? Now raise your hand if you're having a good time. If your hand doesn't go up, your table may not win the award. <laughs> okay, now, I'd like us to look up here because I'm going to show you a, a very important thing. This is called uh, um, How to Develop a Cinematic Memory. Uh, I love it. I developed years ago. And, uh, oh, it's right here. Who can give me the name, please, of an American president whose initials are Abe Lincoln? I drew this myself. I had fun. Um, see the movie. It's a great movie. Should have won the, uh, the Academy. But whatever. Be that as it may. Argo was good. Now, um, let's see. Um, Abraham Lincoln was born in, and he was born in, and they call Kentucky the... And when he was nine years old, his mother and the family. Perfect. Now, I remember when I was in school reading word for word. It was slow, it was arduous, and painful even. Ding! We had reading groups when I was in school, the eagle, the dove, the hurt finch. I was a hurt finch. The eagles had, I don't know, mint juleps brought in. I think they got their feet massaged. An entire bungalow built onto the side of the school, hammocks, lagoons, ducks, whatever. Whereas we, the hurt finches, were chained, manacled, in a line, learning really provocative literature. See, spot, run, spit, spot, run, see, spit, spot. Pat had a hat. I would drift, so we'd be in a line doing a little round robin thing to, you know, get the reading going. Eddie would read The Dog Ran Up the Hill, but he wouldn't read The Dog Ran Up the Hill. He'd read The Dog Ruga Ronda Runda Ra Riga Ra. And I'd feel like astral projecting. Look, Eddie, it's a dog. What's it going to do? Republican, Ramambula? It's going to, like, this run, run? But no. So I would drift aside, I would go off. Uh, John, come back to us. John, come back to us. Come back to us. I thought, what am I coming back to? Purgatory? <laughs> Coming back to the pain and the arduousness of reading, because reading is hard, slow, tough. It's like piling bags of something, riprap on a river. <laughs> Load that bail, tote that bail. Here's what saved me, my mother. May I brag about my mother? My mother graduated number one in her class from UC Berkeley English Literature. My mother loved to read. My father loved to read. And they would read to us all the time. My brother, so if nothing else from the night, read to your children. Even for a few minutes. And when you do, throw heart and soul into it. You could read the Hillsborough phone book poetically. <laughs> Jim Martinez, 1821, Broadshire. There's nothing that can't be done poetically. And incidentally, visual kids like me to talk visually quickly. I hear good things, I see good things. So so visual kids talk fast and use visual predicates. So I see that you're doing well. I see that you're doing well. Auditory kids like it when you give a rise and a fall. Change your voice. Do something different. And here's a cool thing when you're leaving work or going someplace where you have friends. As you go out the door, point to somebody and say these words as you're moving by. I hear good things. And then leave. I hear good things. Do it on a Friday. They'll think, oh, oh what good things, what good things. They'll think about you. Their, your face will be 18 feet by 18 feet. It's like throwing a happiness grenade. Oh, I hear good things. And I hear good things. I hear <laughs> Bye. No. Don't walk up. You have to explain. What? No, no. Go lateral. Bye. I hear good things. And I hear good things. And then get out. I hear good Oh, I hear good things. Hey. What good things? I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Kinesthetic kids like it when you touch stuff. So I have a feeling. How do you know who is which? Give them a piece of paper with print on it. Visual kids immediately start reading it. Auditory kids don't even know you handed it to them. And kids simply play with the paper. That's why I use drawing, because the drawing gets you, to, gets you to use your eye, hand, ear, mouth, eye, hand, ear, mouth. Seems like it's remedial. It's actually accelerative also. Does that make sense? As I'm going to prove to you right now. Now, we just read about Abe Lincoln. And I talk about my travail as a kid. I used to read word for word. And the words all turned into mush. I knew there would be a test, and I would fail it. Help, Dad, I'm going to fail. 
I'm going to be sucked into the vortex yet, into the vortex, not the vortex, not the vortex of doom, not the vortex of doom. When you're talking to your kids, it's often effective to use toys because you can have lots of fun that way. Then it's not about them, it's about a toy. And kids often believe what they overhear more than what they hear. Here's a dirty trick. Ready for this? Instead of saying, let's say you have a child named Ginny, all right? Instead of saying, Ginny, you did really well in school, pretend, be on the phone somewhere, and even if nobody else is at the other end of the phone, go on about how Ginny, Ginny is great. Ah, oh, no, Ginny is the best. She's the, she's trying, ah, she is the best. Kids always believe what they overhear more than what they hear. Why? I mean, gr grown-ups do, perhaps kids do too. Do that with your husband or wife. Terry's the best. She's so, gosh, oh, she's the, nobody's on the other end, it's a dead phone. Nobody's the best. Make sure that Ginny is in the room because otherwise it's a bit of a waste. Actually, don't do that because that would be cheating and lying and wrong. Now, after you read this, say, I, I want to learn a simple, easy way to remember everything three times as well. So I've been waiting all evening to show you these quick couple of things here. This is called the recall comb. The recall what? So after you've read, you know, Abe Lincoln or Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt was born in 1850, or whatever, it doesn't matter. Then you fold a piece of paper in half and you make a list of everything you got as fast as you can in any order. And all you have to remember is what you did, not what you should have. Just what you did, not what you should have. So Abe Lincoln was born 1809. How old was he when his mom died? Mom died. Not your mom. Mom died. Abe. Nine. Went down the Mississippi. M I S S S I S S I P P I. It's early cursive. How many of you have young kids, seven years old and younger, in the house? Uh, how many were seven? Okay, perfect. Uh, incidentally, if you have kids, write things down. Recall goes up 600%. So make a list. Make lists. I call this goo goo writing. I was working with fourth graders once, and then I went into a first grade class, and I was writing cursive on the board and I forgot I was with first graders, and they all went, ooh, he writes so fast. I said, would you like to write? They said, yeah. So I said, cool, I want you to sit like mom and dad do when they write. So all the first graders sat differently. Girls would drop a strap off a shoulder, the boys would look <laughs> serious around the face. I say, pretend like you're really important writers. And they all did it. And now we're gonna skip the part about learning to write and just write. Yeah! And they just the scribbly thing, you know, I showed them a copy of the Declaration of Independence, squirrels and cool stuff, and you know, just mumble, as a joke, as a joke. Then, at the end of, you know, wasting a good two minutes of taxpayers' money, I said, who'd like to read her story? Hands up all over the first grade. Little kids came up and they read their spaghetti writing, like this. I want to have a horse, but I can't have a horse. Jimmy has a horse. He has a horse. He's cool. I'd ride the horse, and I love the horse. He's got crooked yellow teeth and smelly breath. I don't want to get my tan too close to the horse, the front or the back, and I'm going to get kicked by a horse. I wish we had a horse. I'd move to New Jersey in a flash if we could have a horse farm. Or Kentucky, that would be good. And they'd be pages and pages of scribble. Which reminded me why I love kids so much. You can't get away with this with grown-ups that much. But kids? Uh, and uh, I said, hey, kids, you guys are all writers. Now all you have to do is learn how to write. <laughs> See, in school we do it the reverse. Write, 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 learn, 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 learn. If you're good, if you're select, maybe you'll go on to be a writer. I say, no, you are a writer, write. Does that make sense? You are a reader, read. That's how you get to love the thing. I remember once in a gifted conference in California 20 years ago, somebody said, they watched people who were world-renowned in their field, and there was a pattern they all had. It was this. They were exposed to some wow moment or person. So, wow, that's amazing. They got a jolt of wow, and then they played with the material, played with the material, played with the medium, played, 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 and then they practiced, practiced, practiced. So it went from wow to play to practice. And they said, it has to be in that order. Light went off of my, wait, I gotta make it fun. I gotta make it wow. If you look at your own life where you have a passion, I promise you it will trace back to a time, a place, and a person. A time, a place, and a what? 
I love, to this day, I love history. Why? When I was about eight, my grandma showed me a piece of her birthday cake that was 52 years old from a little cherry wood chest in the TV room of her house. I had my grandma all to myself that after. She said, this is the cake we had in the wedding in 1903 or something. I look, wow, 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 wow. Dun, 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 dun. Now, every time I read about anything that's historical, I think about my grandmother. I don't directly think, I think indirectly. I think I love this person. I had a cherished moment. My dad, all about science, all about math, all about thinking about difficult stuff. I became a philosophy major. I cracked my head against Edmund Husserl. Try that one. It's like going through a steel wall. <laughs> Because my dad once had a throwaway comment. He said, some people, John, don't like to think because they think it's hard. And at that moment in my belly, I said, I am going to think and challenge myself. I'm going to study hard stuff, getting into it. Took a pride in pride in that. So sometimes a throwaway remark that you say to your kids will, will guide their whole life. Does that make sense? That's the beauty and the power, and I guess the danger of being a parent. My aunt, I learned to paint and draw because she brought watercolors over and just did the love. She taught me the love of watercolors, not how to do watercolors. It was the love of watercolors. It was the love of science. My dad always said, let's talk about things. He talked about everything. He loved it. Let's talk about the Greeks. He loved it. It wasn't a lesson. He loved it. It's your love that will sell it. Now, to finish, after, this is, clap if that makes sense. Now, you make a list, and then you read the, you know, the paper again, and you read it again. You add more. I call this teeth to the comb. So you add teeth to the comb. And then, after you get a bunch of teeth, then you draw some icons. These are icons. So Abe Lincoln, born in 1809. This looks like a tombstone, but it's a, well, it is a tombstone. It looks like a taco, but it's a tombstone. And this is the Mississippi, and here's a flatboat. And there's Abe Lincoln. There you are. There's your dog. So you just put keywords and numbers, the icons, and then you string them into a story. Into a what? And so here's the story. This is uh, Abe Lincoln's life in a very quick little thing. He was born in 1801. And he was born in Kentucky. What do they call Kentucky? Blue, 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 blue. Blue, blue. When you draw, it gives you a chance to repeat. Blue, 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 blue. Because when you're not drawing, it's hard to do that. Blue, 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 blue. It's like you're on drugs or something. <laughs> Don't be on drugs. That's what would be my next come. Now, how old was he when his mom died? No, then the family traveled. I can't draw the family traveling. Sure. <laughs> Travel. Draw a diagram plus sound effects, and it'll be a movie in your brain. What color was the cow's underwear? <laughs> I have the kids do sound effects inside their head. Here's the sound of a rocket ship blasting off. Here's the same sound in your head. Raise your hand if you can hear that. OK, now try this. Your head is the most expensive movie studio ever created. Raise your hand if you can hear the squawk of geese. Perfect. Now. Five men chewing celery stalks three blocks down. Go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, a door, a door slamming in South Chicago. A nail being squeaked out of something, somebody wrenching it open angrily in Louisiana right now. Ah, perhaps a couple of swear words. Not that there would be swearing. If you can get into the senses, so you don't have five senses, you have 10 senses. You have the actual five and the imagined five. As a reader, don't read like a reader, read like a movie director. When it says Abe Lincoln went down the Mississippi, who's playing the part of Lincoln? Who's playing the part of the, the steerage guy? Who's playing the part of the Mississippi? What's it like out there? Get kids to go into the Mississippi using their 10 senses, the imagined five senses. So finally, um, and sometimes I remember uh, when I was a teacher, kids would sometimes interrupt me. You could make a list not of your children's annoying behaviors, but other children's annoying behaviors. So as a teacher, I said, if kids are interrupting me, I'll just interrupt myself first. So what was the river that Abe Lincoln went down? Oh, look, here's Toby the lobster person interrupting me again. 
don't do that, Toby. I love you, but not. No, no. We've had this talk. I used to have toys for every problem. If you two can't sit together, I'm moving you. I mean it. I think you owe her an apology. Don't walk away while we're talking. Okay, then be that way, but you will lead a lonely life. It takes a big person to step up. You two run along and play now. Toys. Don't wait for something to happen and pounce on the child. Take it out on toys and then wink at the child. <laughs> Abe Lincoln lived in Springfield, Springfield, Springfield. He was a tall man. He was actually six foot four. So how tall was he? He married a short, attractive woman, Mary Todd Lincoln. She collected 300 pairs of gloves. How many pairs of gloves? And then he lost eight elections. Eight, 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 eight. Your brain loves rhyme, rhythm, and repetition. Rhyme, rhythm, and what? Six times seven equals 42. Sticks in heaven on a warty shoe. He was elected president. Civil war broke out. He helped free the slaves. General Grant lived the north. General Lee lived the south. We see General Lee on his horse. His horse is named Traveler. What's her name? And we can tell because she has a traveler's check. Don't leave home. You've got 10 minutes to memorize the life of Lincoln. Time is up. What year was he born? How old was he when his mom died? What was the river he went down? How many pairs of gloves did his wife collect? And what color was the traveler's check? And which is easier for your brain to remember? This or this? This. Somebody tell me why you think that is. Why do you think it is? Why is it anybody? Why do you think that, why do you think that is? Why is this easier than that slew of words? Anybody? What's that? Yes, and what, make, what makes the picture easier? What do you think makes a picture? I don't have like the one and only right answer. What do you guys think? You created this picture. Well, you, yeah, okay, one is you had to make, first of all, when you think about the, the, the steps. Number one, you read something. Number two, you made the list of everything you could think of quickly. Then you reread it, added things to the recall comb, added more things, and then you made little drawings. And the act, see, if I said, let's draw a picture of George Washington crossing the Delaware, even with stick figures and whatnot, it would force you to think in detail, which forces you to ask questions, which forces you to make connections. And then when you look at the painting, you see it like a hawk. It's called secondary ignorance. Primary ignorance is you know you don't know something. Secondary ignorance is you don't know you don't know something. So if, I want to, if, I, if we were studying Columbus, I'd have you draw a picture of Columbus's ship, the Nina, and you'd have a million questions. Then you'd turn to page 538 and look at the picture like never before. Ah, oh, we've seen it. You think you have, you haven't. A great way to find out what you don't know is draw a picture. What does the Pentagon look like? A Pentagon, draw it, take a look, then do an aerial view and see what that looks like. Does that make sense? So, a quick review. Say, I, I read the story about Abe Lincoln, or whatever, made the comb, read the story again, added more teeth to the comb, drew the icons, I don't have to be great, because now mom and dad are drawing pictures all over the place. And incidentally, if you do draw pictures all over the place, it's a great bonding thing with your kids. But first, see this? I used to have kids memorize the picture and then give a book report with no notes. Why does that work? Because they get to be in the moment. They get to talk it from what it's really there. They get to do it from pictures and they can put it in their own words. If you want to put something in your own words, this won't do it. You just read that. Put it in your own words. Read their words. Make your pictures. Turn it into your words. When he was nine years old, who died? His mother. He came up to his father. He said, let's get a preacher and bury her. His father said, no, 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 no. We just he said, no. I'm gonna. So Abe Lincoln, who didn't have clothes that fit till he was 50, went walking around with his clothes ill-fitting. He gets barefoot out into the wilderness, 1818, 18, and finds a preacher builds his mother's coffin, pulls it up a hill on a rope. What does this say about a little guy? He's committed. So when the South, 50 years later, said, we are seceding, he said, no, you're not, big fella. You're not. You're not leaving. You can't simply say, well, we don't like this, whatever, we're going to go. No, because then everybody could fracture up and go and, and whatever. And then what we said as a declaration, it makes, it makes no sense. So he was able to stand up to his dad 
stand up to the, to, to the South. Now, why is that important? Because everything I've ever read about literacy is simply three simple things. Number one, big picture. Number two, sequence. And number three, little details. Let's all do this together. Say, I, I, I read for the big picture, the sequence, and the details. The big, big picture, the sequence, and the little details. Now, just a couple more things before we stop tonight. But basically, raise your hand if you sort of understand the recall comb and the shoestring outline. Way cool. And again, what color was the cow's underwear? Now, a couple cool, quick things. Um, here's a way to really develop some literacy in the house. Um, I told you I was uh, in the reading groups, the, uh, the eagle, the dove, the herd finch. And so we'd read something like the dog ran up the hill. So what I have kids do is actually take their finger and draw what they just read with their finger on the paper. And they draw it so that they can see it. If they drew it with a pencil, they try to get it perfect. Does that make sense? So the imaginary television gets you to stop and, and see things more closely. Now, I was telling the teachers today, because I work with social studies teacher, uh, about George Washington. Here's a little thing about George Washington. The first battle of the French and Indian War. Watch this. George Washington is in a tent. Here's a tent. And he's sick. He's lying sick in the tent. So he's in a what? He's in a tent. They come to him and say, look, we're losing. We're retreating. It's all falling apart. George Washington straps two pillows onto a horse and goes out sick, stomach flu, something, into battle, OK? Into battle. First horse gets shot out from under him, OK? Get another horse, put the pillows on. Second horse, shot out from under him, OK? Get another horse, pillows. At the end of the day, George Washington has two bullet holes in his hat, his hat, which is awfully close to his head. And incidentally, down here, here's his coat. It has four bullet holes in it. Here's a guy who's sick, could sleep, we're losing, gets out of bed, straps pillows to a horse, gets two horses shot out from under him, his, his hat shot off twice, four bullets in his coat, and they win the day. What does that mean? It's not about history. It's not about George Washington. It's about being unstoppable. Hopefully, you'll never have to do that. But people have done that. Why does it matter? Because you get to be a parent who's a storyteller. If we put it all together from tonight, it's basically this. Talk in pictures. Make stories. Find out what motivates your kids. And basically, it'll be what do you do for fun, what are you good at or want to be good at, and who are your heroes and sheroes. Draw the facts, because the brain remembers stuff a lot better if you make pictures. But I can't draw. Then draw poorly. Those aren't great drawings. It gets the point across more than just a, a, a bunch of type. Does that make sense? And just a couple more things before we stop. Watch this. Here's somebody trying to draw a horse. <laughs> Mrs. Gady, could I have another piece of paper, please? I messed up. I can't. And so inside the child's head becomes the worry voice. It's the voice that says, I can't, I didn't, I never will. And this often happens with gifted kids because they get very frightened. We don't see that, but it's inside the So my horse looks like that. Now again, how many of you would like to have successful kids in the world? Show of hands. About 60%. It's getting a little bit better. These are the two secrets of success. So important. And since you are the people that make the world work, I'm going to whisper them like a wizard would do. Number one, learn to focus on the parts you like. Focus on the parts you like. And number two, use your mistakes. You can get through a lot of problems if you focus on the parts you like and use your mistakes. Had a bad day? 
yeah. Nothing good happened? Nothing, nothing good? Nothing. Were you hit by a bus? No. Something good happened. Something terribly good happened. Focus on it. Had a bad day, but you're, here's a big person. I had a bad day, but thank goodness my younger sister had a good day. You can actually have your kids make a like-ometer. A what-ometer? And while other kids are telling stories about how things don't work and nothing is perfect as they'd like it to be, your kids can be doing the reverse, focusing on anything they like. So for example, I don't like the horse, but I do like the hoof. So I shall focus on the hoof. I shall even make a like-ometer. Here's a like-ometer. Hate the horse, love the hook. Focus on that. Had a bad day, but we had pizza sticks. Focus on that. Had a bad day, but yesterday we had pizza sticks. Had a bad day, but someday I'm going to have a pizza stick. <laughs> See, kids need to know that they have the power. What stops us is the stuff that's hard and scary. Hard and scary. Many things in the world are hard and scary, but mostly what it is is what we're being hard and scary on ourselves. And a lot of gifted kids get very hard and very scary on themselves. Especially if they're trying to save the world. Especially if they got, like, you know, parents that are struggling. And they're so smart. And if they go to Harvard, maybe then they'll big, bring a big enough trophy back to mom and dad that you were okay and I saved you. That was my childhood. I had to go to Harvard since the, like, because I, I, I had to save my family. I scored high on tests, I did well, I had to save them. I spent half my life trying to save something, because I just didn't feel enough. And no matter what I did, where I went, I didn't feel enough. A lot of kids are that way. I feel real compassion for kids. But I went through the system, got A's, did well, went to good schools, did all that, and, and still was like, you know, doing right things for wrong reasons. I look back on my life now, I would have rather failed more and feared less. I would have said, hey, wolf of fear, eat me. Eat me. I'm going to eat you back. You eat me, I'm going to eat you back. Because I'm bigger than you. Imagination is bigger than fear. It's always bigger than fear. If you let it be, but remember this, it's we who add to the hard and scary. The world is hard and scary enough, so the thing is to take things that are hard and scary and make them fun and challenging. Make it fun and challenging. A couple of quick things before we stop. First, the Muji drawing. Oh, incidentally, I said, use your mistakes. A little girl the other day was drawing a picture, couldn't think of what to draw, made a mistake. I said, add stuff. She added a million things. And incidentally, I mentioned, I did a book uh, drawing on the inventive mind. We have gobs of activities all about using drawing as a, as a reading, writing, memory tool. This is, this is one of them, uh, where you pull out zillions of words. So this is called the add-on, the add-on, and you pull out, pull out words, lots and lots and lots and lots of things like this. And the last two things, take your hand and go like this. Take your other hand and go like this. Take your head and go like this. And say the word Muji. Say, I, I don't have to draw the outside. I could make a boo-boo. So instead, so you can make a boo-boo at every point. Ouch, 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 awkward, poor construction, terrible, terrible. So instead, here's the Muji. When you do a Muji, you don't do the outside. You do the middle. Say, I, I got a big old crayon. Round and round and up and down, big old scribble Muji. And if you're angry, do an angry Muji. <laughs> there we see mom on a horse with no name. It felt good to get out of the rain in the desert. Oh, lapsing back into the 60s. This is a Muji, incidentally. This is a Muji drawing. Here's a picture of a horse by a fifth grade boy. And it looks like, uh, it looks like this. And I guess you can laugh because, you know, he's not here to defend himself. <laughs> and five minutes later, the same boy, Muji to a horse. Horse, Muji. This is try to be a perfect parent, do everything perfect, perfect. It gets a little constricted. This is Muji down. And finally, this is a picture. A teacher said, I can't draw a straight line. I said, don't. So she Muji'd her dog, and her dog looked like this. 
Two quick things. Raise your hand if you've had a good time this evening. Would you like to um, find a way to have your kids never procrastinate ever? <laughs> We're going to finish with a couple of really way cool things. Here's the thought you can do. This works for me. Every task divided into three tasks, beginning, middle, and end. It goes like this. I used to say to myself, because I'm a writer, I love to write, and I'd say every night I'm going to write for 30 minutes. I never did it. I just tossed and turned for 45 minutes, beating myself up. I didn't realize my head was just an aquarium full of fish. I thought they were just beating me up, and, and they were. Until, wait, those are thoughts going by. Just thoughts. Then I discovered a very simple thing. I said, I'm going to write for one minute every night. It was as hard to stop after one minute, because what tires us always is our imagination. It's as hard to stop after one minute as it is to start if you have to do 30 minutes, which in your mind becomes 30 years. So three things. Number one, starting it. Number two, doing it. Number three, celebrating. Now, after you all leave, I'm going to be dancing around and then celebrating because I love to celebrate and tell my subconscious I had a great time. Even if you don't have a great time, you can have a great time. I discovered something the other day while being in a hotel working with children at the, at the State Gifted. I told these children, we're standing next to the, uh, the, uh, the, the brownies. And I said, uh, for fun, I said, uh, don't eat all the brownies. They, they said, and little kids, little smart kids, like your kids, they often feel like little speaker systems for adults, only in the shape of children, because they have these incredibly adult-sounding voices. I wasn't intending to eat all the brownies, sir. Well, of course you were, just don't. And that put me in a bit of a funny mood, so I walked down and I, I discovered a little thing I now think of all the time that I'm offering you as we close here. And it goes, it'll be really goofy, but some of you will take the message from the wizard. <laughs> I said to myself, in the back of my head, because normally we get a mood based on weird, undeveloped thoughts in the back of our head, you know, vague thoughts. So I thought, why not just put in a vague thought of your own choosing? Here's my thought, and I'd love to see us today as you all walk out the building with this thought. The thought is this, wherever you are, wherever you are, you, in the back of your mind, don't tell anyone, they'll lock you up. In the back of your mind, think, I own the place. I own this place, I own the school. I say we knock out a wall and put it in a tennis court. I put it in a dome here and we put some kind of uh, arc lighting, and then we put an astronomy lab there and have things swinging down. We make a zoo out of that room. I thought, well, this is really cool, because if you own the place, silently without saying, you can fire anyone you want. Don't like somebody? They're fired. Over with. You're over with. I would never, of course, do that in life, but the feeling of owning a place was a kind of a fun thing. Now, if you're standing in the desert, you own the land. Try this when you're all by yourself, preferably. So you know, buying that building, moving that factory, just your mind cannot tell the difference between a memory and an imagining. So what did we learn tonight? We learned focus on fun, what you do well, and looking up to things. I'll leave you with this last story about my mother. Uh, my mother went into the Red Cross uh, with her magna cum laude in World War II. And uh, she went to North uh, Africa in the thick of the fighting in World War II. And uh, she was a Red Cross nurse, and she wrote letters home from North Africa. And in one of the letters she wrote, I feel so inadequate to the task. And then a couple of paragraphs later she said, she said to her commanding officer, put me in your worst wards. So my mother got put where they got blown up and burned alive. And one young man, 19 years old from Kansas, who was bandaged over 95% of his body, starts to write a letter home to his family in Kansas in 1942, and he begins with these words, dearest family, I have met with a slight accident. So when I'm having a bad hair day, two things float into my head. One is, I'm scared, but put me in your worst wards. Secondly, I've had a slight accident, don't worry. Now I'm gonna leave you with this last little picture. This is a picture I did in front of second graders years ago, and this is a story written by a seven-year-old girl. Raise your hand if you can draw a picture this well. Looks like the Kool-Aid jar thing.
The girl, seven years old, writes these words. There once lived a potato that had no job. I like that, an unemployed potato. <laughs> so he went to the job place, the job place, and found he could lead a parade. So he did, but there was no parade, an existential seven-year-old. So he did, but there was no parade. So he looked and looked, and they said, you don't look for it. It comes. And so he waited, and it did, and he was happy. The end. Now I ask you, if you didn't have a picture, you didn't draw a picture, didn't talk, what would you do? Say, what do unemployed potatoes do? We'll finish with the oath of creative parenting. Please put up a hand and repeat after me if you would. I promise, always, if I feel like it, to focus on the parts I like and to use my mistakes. And in the words of John Kennedy, if I'm not having fun, I'm not doing it right. In the words of Helen Keller, life is a daring adventure or it's nothing at all. In the words of Sitting Bull, let's all put our heads together and see what kind of world we can make for our children. Now, Matt is gonna give, come up and give you a couple of uh, quick announcements. Uh, if you guys have any questions, you wanna find out what I do, it's there. If you wanna get a book, I'll autograph it. Uh, there are not many left, but you can, you can still get them. Raise your hand if you had a good time. I want you to take one more deep breath and breathe out. And before Matt gives the announcement, I'd, I would like you to take a look around. And I really think you were the ones who showed up. You were the ones who stayed. I want you to feel really proud of yourself because your kids know what you do in a deeper place beyond understanding and explanation. You guys are the best. You really are. My heart goes out to New Jersey. And bless you, I hope the weather holds up and you never have any Sandys ever again. And now for Matt. So if you had a good time and you learned something new that you can use with your children, let's thank John one more time for that. Wild applause. All right. You guys are all best table. You're all best table. So tomorrow, sometime early day tomorrow, you'll receive an email from me with the additional resources that John was talking about. Uh, we'll also be posting the video of tonight's presentation on the REACH website and the district's YouTube channel uh, tomorrow. So you can share that with friends who couldn't be here or if you just want to watch something back again or get some other ideas. And finally, if you're interested in one of John's books, uh, I suspect we'll run out. And what we can do at that point, only if you pay him up front though, we can have him ship any additional ones to my office here and I can get them to you through your child's teacher. So if you're interested, that's fine. Uh, no obligation. No. You're welcome, John. Thanks again for coming out. Have a safe drive home.